Follow me with your shape shifting smiles and I see you. Maybe they'll believe you. Illuminati, a cold dawn trap. Silver discs and hidden files and we see you. We've got to believe you. off on an epic episode of the hyper anomalous esoteric research organization podcast also known as hero paranormal my name is ryan the anomalous ambassador of the airwaves broadcasting from just south of area 51 at the base of la madre mountain and we've got a banger today if you want it deep, if you want to go down the rabbit hole and get all the info possible from someone who knows it, sometimes you have to kind of wade through it. But many have explained over the years that enlightened masters are able to speak almost in parables, telling you deeper truths about conspiracy theories, the new world order, and uh, doing so without disambiguation. So what is the Illuminati? Well, the Illuminatus, or the Enlightened, is a name given to several groups. Historically, the name refers to the Enlightenment of a secret society founded May 1st, 1776 in Bavaria. The society's stated goals were to oppose superstition, religious influence over public life, and the abuses of state power. The order of the day was against injustice. And let's just say that subsequently, many other groups have been uh, enlightened. And various organizations are alleged to be a continuation of the original Illuminati. These organizations have often been accused of conspiring to control world affairs, masterminding events, and planting agents in governments, corporations, and other places of note. But the reality is... The Illuminati is most widely known as a group pulling the strings, the levers of power, and they understand things that the average common man does not. Well, when it comes to the latter part of that definition, the truth is my guest would fit the bill as to someone who has information, education, and is scholarly aware of things that the average citizenry is not. His name is Nicholas Laos. I consider him a friend, and he's a heck of an author with a variety of deep reaching books and works, which we will get into. He is a grand master of the AOMPRSM, Autonomous Order of the Modern and Perfecting Rite of Symbolic Masonry, and very aware of what makes the world work. He is the author of a multitude of books having to do with symbolic masonry, and by that account alone, be very much enlightened or illuminated. So I'm going to ask him some hard questions, and I ask that you be patient and you read between the lines, listen to everything he says, and have eyes to see. And what I mean by that is it's easy to just listen to words and not pay attention to the feeling of what is being said, but with Nicholas Laos, he has very deep, responsibly coordinated answers. He does his best to tell the truth to the best of his approximation, and his answers are lengthy. So listen, contemplate, and gather as much as you can. It should be a heck of a ride and quite the journey. Before we get to it, if you haven't gone over to HeroParanormal.com, please check it out. Ton of content over there, as well as click on the shop, and we have all kinds of goodies you can buy to support the podcast. If you prefer something more along the lines of health and wellness, head on over to HappinessMedical.com, 
Anything you purchase there will also help support the podcast. And last, but definitely definitely not least, if you're listening via YouTube, do me the solid to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. Although I will most likely never be monetized due to the topics I cover and the truth, if you like, share, and subscribe, it will help me break through that algorithm of control. The shadow ban is real. All right. And again, with some of the more intelligent guests that I have an opportunity to talk to, I always value the conversations with Nicholas. He does not mince words and he answers very completely, but he takes his time. So be patient. It has been said that the wisest of men speak in parables. And although Nicholas does not mince words, he answers things truthfully and correctly. Just be sure to understand fully what it is he's saying. So without further ado, let's get to the Grand Master, Nicholas Laos. Welcome to the Hero Paranormal Podcast. Thank you very much. An honor and pleasure to be with you. The honor is all mine. I know you've been very busy with a lot of undertakings and research projects. Um, Before we get to it, uh, let's tell listeners what you're working on currently, and I know you've been very busy with it. Thank you very much. I I am... um... I have been working uh, since uh, the beginning of this year um, on, uh, on the final stage of a research project in, in mathematics, uh, including mathematical philosophy, but um, it deals mainly with uh, a systematic study of the foundations of uh, algebra, what we call linear algebra, uh, different aspects of geometry and mathematical analysis. All these combined together in a systematic way and investigating also specific problems uh, from different realms of applications in, in both social sciences and natural sciences, of course. That sounds fascinating. And, you know, Mathematics is one of those things that very much is a language, a codex of sorts. So it seems to me, you know, obvious that a systematic study of that is uh, pretty pretty important, but probably very very difficult. I'm sure you're not you're not you you you're not worried about tackling that, but I would be. <laughs> um, I I would rather say. It is a challenging field, but unfortunately, um, I think in, in most places around the world, uh, during high school years, um, it is a subject that it is very often taught in a rather um, ineffective, uh, ineffective way. Uh, so th- we we have to do at some point we, we, we have to do justice to this and th- 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 there are pedagogical challenges in the field uh, but unfortunately um, it is uh, it is a, a rather international I could say phenomenon of, of, of having this uh, uh, of having mathematics taught uh, in 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 a rather Uh, ineffective and problematic way, which uh, 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 doesn't allow students uh, to grasp its meaning, significance, and uh, I could say attractiveness. Yes. And it, you know, it's studies like these and the systematic study of things that are codexes that you seem so very well versed in your your books are amazing can we go ahead and tell listeners where they can purchase your books and the names of your works uh i i'm i would uh, rather uh suggest to uh, uh emphasize uh, my cooperation with cambridge scholars publishing in uh, in england uh, regarding certain 
aspects of my work in, in philosophy and esotericism. And in fact, my coming book, which uh, uh, will be called The Concise Course of Mathematics with Applications, uh, will be published by Cambridge Scholars Publishing as well. Uh, so if they visit that, they, they can find my work there. And I, 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 for more technical subjects, I, I, I have also published with other publishers, but uh, over there may, maybe uh, it will be too specialized. However, uh, what I would like to, to say is that um, I feel really pleased about my cooperation with Cambridge Scholars Publishers, Publishing because uh, we, we uh, cooperate on, on several aspects of, uh, of philosophy and, and mathematics. And they have also welcomed, even though they are a scholarly publisher uh, uh, based on rigor and uh, in the sense of academic rigor, uh, uh, they, they have welcomed also my work in, in uh, the philosophy of esotericism and Freemasonry. Um, and uh, regarding uh, what you have actually accurately said, about, about mathematics and language, I would like to, to just give a hint uh, to, to our listeners that uh, based on the principles of abstraction and syllogism, uh, mathematicians study the quantitative and the qualitative relations and uh, the forms of space whereby space in mathematics, we mean any structured set. And uh, then they identify various connections in the processes that take place in reality, and they formulate them in the form of logical sentences written in symbols. And as far as the heuristic role of mathematics is concerned, that is the articulation of new results, uh, which then acquire empirical significance and confirmation or a new interpretation, I would like to say that the heuristic role of mathematics is based on the correct representation of reality by mathematical models. And of course, uh, by a model in science and specifically in mathematics, um, we mean something very specific, namely a model is intended as a carefully and methodically simplified analog of real world phenomena and situations, and its deductive structure helps scientists to explore the consequences of alternative assumptions. So, um, given that scientific modeling aims to explain how things are and why things are the way they are, as well as to analyze and evaluate alternative assumptions. It contrasts, for instance, with the use of basic statistical methods solely to summarize empirical data. And, and, and moreover, uh, one can experiment with, model, with the model uh, by changing the assumptions uh, when it would be epistemologically, technically, and or morally, of course, impossible and or too risky to experiment with the real world. So uh, in the context of my work in mathematical modeling, I have been using two categories of mathematical models. Uh, one, cate one category of mathematical models depends on the Italian physicist and engineer Galileo's method. And the other category of mathematical models depends on uh, the so-called general system theory uh, which is originally due to the Austrian biologist uh, Ludwig uh, von uh, Bertalanthi. So uh, I don't want to uh, uh, possibly uh, um, uh, say too much at this stage about uh, this type of work, but uh, of course this includes both um, uh, scientific and philosophical challenges because uh, we have to realize that uh, actually, science is, is something created, and it is something created by human consciousness. So, in every aspect of scientific work, 
uh, there is a dynamic interplay between the reality of the world and the reality of consciousness, which is also fascinating and as a subject, of course, um, overlaps with um, uh, uh, aspects may, that one could uh, find uh, in, in different uh, branches of, of human thought, uh, including even, I could say, in a sense, esotericism. I, I agree 100%. I think science is one of those languages that we understand and created, and it is getting mixed up in a lot of esotericism, at least through quantum mechanics, through, you know, many of the quintessential you know alchemical elements including chemistry and i i find it very interesting that these days you know the quantum mechanics and the quantum physics involved with science is very much merging and melding with spiritualism esotericism and the occult and i find it interesting that you know much like the enochian language is a language mm. you know of the of the Elohim, let's say, or of, of those non-human intelligences that now we are finding in philosophy and esotericism that there seems to be correlations, at least through quantum physics, quantum mechanics, mathematics. And it's, it's often said, I'm, 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 you know, very, very impressed that you always seem to be approaching these larger questions from different angles. And I've noticed that it teaches you to be very creative, Nicholas. My, my question to you is, in these days of quantum mechanics, artificial intelligence, and the realization and almost the acceptance worldwide of UFOs or UAPs, flying saucers, etc., science seems to at least be opening their minds and their eyes to the possibility of recognizing something which before was incomprehensible to even pay any attention to. Do you believe that these things are in some way related to the macrocosm, the Elohim, or possibly non-human intelligence? Um, I have to say that uh, the exploration of human intelligence itself is uh, such an immense, fascinating, and huge subject that uh, actually I cannot see an actual, at least insurpassable bar barrier between what we call human intelligence and any superhuman intelligence. Um, what I find really very fascinating and uh, worth exploring further and further uh, from what you have so pointedly addressed is that we have to delve into the essence of scientific creation and methodology in, in a very dynamic way which overlaps with the most ambitious aspects of, uh, of alchemical and occult thinking. Um, here, uh, I would like to, to, to mention a mainstream scholar, uh, the French epistemologist Gaston Bachelard, B-A-C-H-E-L-A-R-D. Uh, Gaston Bachelard pointed out that science is a mental process that aims to create concepts that contribute to an ever closer approach to reality. And the phases through which consciousness passes in the context of scientific creation uh, are the following. Um, firstly, an intuitive general conception of its object. Secondly, an analytic distinction of the individual elements that make up the given object. 
And in fact, during this stage, a rigorous evaluation of those elements takes place. And thirdly, a synthesis of the aforementioned elements leading to the final interpretation of the scientific object in its entirety. So according to Bachelard, the scientific object is constructed by the scientific consciousness and therefore, rather than being seen in terms of dualism and opposition, empiricism and rationalism complement each other in the context of scientific creation. And therefore, both a priori methods or reason and a posteriori methods or dialectic are parts of scientific research. And in, in fact, uh, if you allow me, in, in, in light of my claim that a synthesis between philosophical realism and idealism is required in order to formulate a proper ontology, uh, reality is not merely an object whose various individual manifestations are grasped in a static way by a scientist's consciousness. On the contrary, reality is an end, a telos, towards which a scientist's consciousness is directed in a dynamical way and with the aim of annihilating the distance between consciousness and reality. Uh, this process results in the objectification of a scientific theory generated by this very process, and this objectification is the essence of scientific creation. Uh, therefore, science, including mathematics, is both an invention and a discovery. By the, term, the term invention refers to a conscious process of planning and producing something in order to meet a specific reason, and the term discovery refers to the provision of observational evidence and to the development of an initial understanding of some phenomenon, usually pertaining to natural occurrences. So science, science scientific creation, is both an invention and a discovery. And in the context of scientific creation, deduction, induction, and analogy are the methods by which a scientist's consciousness works depending on the nature of the scientific object in question. Uh, mm -hmm. in its, uh, if, if I may clarify this, possibly for, for those who are not very familiar with the terminology, uh, I would like to say that in essence, uh, uh, Deduction is particularly applicable to mathematics, which presupposes the existence of an ideal reality that is differentiated according, according to the axioms that underpin it, um, whereas uh, induction is particularly applicable to experimental and generally applied science, which presupposes the existence of a sensible reality that appears in the form of individual experiences. And consciousness transcends these experiences by integrating them into a larger hypothetical reality, which is based on a model created by consciousness. And, of course, consciousness aims to confirm this model through empirical tests. Mm -hmm. I think this, this is very important because, you know, it is, it is said that in noble creation of all creatures that numbers sometimes are without a doubt the concealment of great secrets and i i see that numbers re realistically where it comes to science chemistry alchemy and mathematics hold a lot of secrets they are a codex of sorts and it's said at least in some teachings that you know this uh that that the creator guides those below him wondrously and i think that was in the fourth psalm that basically you know you have to 
with the wondrous nature of these sciences, whether it's alchemy, mathematics, um, science in general, this these these are the keys to unlock a great many secrets. Is is that your view as well, Nicholas? Yes. And let me ask you something that I'm fascinated by is uh, in in speaking with um, someone with top secret uh, information having to do with a lot of these, again, non-human intelligences, things that used to be referred to as being of the ether um, or just below the firmament. Now they've taken on different, you know, the different names, as is often the case, and I believe it was Peter who said uh, that the earth existed in and out of water. And we're finding that when I speak with these people, it seems that the some of the most top secret, high, most guarded uh, developments are having to do with these lights, if we want to call them that these non human intelligences, which I believe they are, but these objects which are able to move in a transmedium ability, meaning from the air to the water and out of the water to the air without slowing down. I know that this is a little bit off topic, but in your opinion, are are these, are these universal spirits or these creatures of the air or these unidentified aerial phenomena, are these something which have been involved with the earth as we know it since the beginning of at least humankind? Um, I have been working for several years uh, in a rather humble yet systematic way uh, in several projects in, in mathematical physics and my perspective uh, is uh, from the perspective, of course, of, of mathematical physics and epistemology, which is the uh, what we call philosophy of science. Um, I think that uh, we can tackle this issue at three different levels. Uh, firstly, I could say that Humanity has been developing science and technology for millennia. Um, And actually, civilization is inconceivable without science, technology, and energy. After all, this is the essence of the Promethean mythos. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I believe that uh, there is a huge wealth of uh, scientific and technological knowledge that is asymmetrically distributed and communicated uh, to humanity for several for several reasons. Um, so let's first of all bear in mind that and keep in mind that not all of us have the same access to actual scientific and technological achievements at the same time. This is something we have to keep in mind. Uh, the second aspect is, um, a part of the, uh, let's call this the institutional aspect. The second aspect, let's call it the spiritual aspect, is that human consciousness has tremendous and admirable capabilities and can conceive several aspects of reality, not only of actuality, but also of potentiality. 
And in this context, human consciousness has invented one of the most impressive uh, and unique to the humankind phenomena, which is religion and mythology. Uh, in this context, human consciousness manifests itself through achievements that require one's rise into very high levels of intentionality in order to be able to grasp, not to mention create, a successful and inspiring religious narrative or spiritual narrative. Uh, that is why both the founders of religions and uh, the very good novelists are a very, 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 very rare, very few and very select persons. Uh, in this context, uh, in a symbolic language, and in, in, in highly complex systems of narration, um, several truths are communicated and several messages are revealed and or concealed, transmitted in, in, in a hierarchical, let's say, way. And the third aspect which I would like to highlight is um, uh, a theory of truth. We have to, 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 to study. Uh, of course, this is a huge issue which uh, we could not cover in, in, in this program uh, here and now, but it is worth investigating the issue of, of the theory of truth and to see how many aspects uh, and how many contributions um, are available to us uh, regarding this very fascinating and thought-provoking issue. Uh, can I give a few hints? Yes, yes, please. Uh, right now, I'm thinking out of the blue and uh, Without having prepared myself for this type of discussion, let me highlight a few things as they cross my mind. Uh, in the context of the relations between the classical logical values true and false, false means untrue, we must distinguish the term false not only from the term true, but also from the term erroneous, the term absurd, the term irrational, and the term fallacious. The term erroneous means a structural and automatic lapse in reasoning that cannot be corrected. The term absurd also means a definite error but although not amenable to correction itself, it may constitute a criterion for correcting a series of syllogisms in which we deliberately place it, the absurd, when we use it as an instrument of reference, um, especially in the context of the form of argument that is called reductio ad absurdum reduction to absurdity, where we try to establish a claim by showing that the opposite scenario would lead to absurdity or contradiction. The term irrational means the conclusion of a series of syllogisms that are not logically connected to each other, and uh, the intellectually pathological nature of its proposition to which the irrational is reduced has a perverse effect on the entire series of syllogisms that results in the irrational. So I have just clarified the difference between the term false on the one hand and the terms erroneous, absurd, and irrational. But now I find very fascinating uh, to contemplate for a few minutes on the term fallacious. 
Mm -hmm. uh, understanding the concept of the fallacious in the context of logic is somewhat more complex. The difference between the fallacious and the false can be understood if we have previously understood the difference between the correct and the true. The false is the exact opposite of the correct, but the contrast between the true and the fallacious is neither absolute nor insurmountable. The fallacious is an approximation of the true in the sense that it lacks the element of correctness, but approaches the true. The fallacious tends to the true. The correct, what we call the concept of correctness, the correct is the unique conclusion of the generally understood true, and it encompasses the fallacious, which is a deviation from the correct, but is subject to correction. So fallacy means an intellectual wavering with a demand for truth, whereas correctness means the precise targeting of the truth. Therefore, a fallacy prepares the consciousness to reach a truth, and the conception of truth as correctness refers to the culmination of the effort to reach a truth in an absolutely accurate manner. That is why in science we have always, as you said at the beginning of this discussion, we have to be open-minded, creative, and dynamically working as regards our quest for the real truth or equivalently as regards our quest for the conception of truth as correctness. I like that. That truly is after the truth with a capital T. And it kind of, I like how it shows, you know, ba basically the, the reason for being the great fundamentals of like enlightenment and getting up. And I like how, how you, how, how you approach that from three different angles um, without going too deeply into each, because as, as many know, you know, uh, there, I, I believe it was Tesla, Nikola Tesla, who said those who know the power of three, six and nine control the universe. You know, the, the three, I mean, obviously triang triangles are the strongest structure. And of course we have the Trinity and the, I believe it's been said three worlds dwell in one and there are three natural suns in the world, and threes go on and on. Um, very good answer, and I like that you took your time answering that. Definitely, it definitely goes to show that true enlightenment is, is a worthy reason for being and very fundamental to, to being a complete human. Um, let me ask you this. There's been uh, kind of switching gears a little bit. I'm, I'm reminded of how there seems to be, at least in, in a philosophical sense, sort of a censorship or a controlling of many internet-based internet knowledge systems, message boards, what have you. And it seems AI is being incorporated into that. It reminds me, at least historically, you know, that now they're able to do things like shadow ban, which wasn't something we had in the past. And I remember Socrates going way back, who was charged, convicted, and executed for corrupting the minds of the youth. Well, I mean, Socrates was actually guilty in that sense, but how can a free society that supports philosophical thought come to such a conclusion? And do you think that that's happening in modern days, but just to a different extent? Uh, <clears throat> Let me at this point contribute in two ways to your elaboration. Firstly, 
of course, we can uh, identify, indeed, considerable emerging constraints. At the same time, though, we can also, and we have to also, identify considerable emerging opportunities for creativity. Let me give an example based on the theory of networks as it is studied both in mathematics and in other scientific disciplines. I will speak very simply. When the density of a network increases, namely when, imagine, for instance, driving in, in a rush hour in a very busy highway, so the density of the network increases, then the degrees of freedom in the sense of freedom of action in this case, this is what I mean, tend to decrease. If there is, for instance, a very busy highway, then you have not several opportunities to, to, to undertake initiatives in driving. This is, though, one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that in a very dense network, the unconventional, or if you like, the non-conformist behavior of a single actor will have a significant impact to the system because it is highly, densely interconnected. So, by this I want to say the following. I'll give two examples. Imagine driving in a very busy highway during rush hour. The constraints under which you have to drive are very strict. But, if a single driver in this situation behaves in a non-conformist way, then the impact of his or her behavior on the entire system will be very significant. Mm -hmm. Whereas, if you drive in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a remote road with very few cars passing by, there you have much more freedom as far as the opportunities of driving and driving style and driving decisions are concerned, but you have very low impact on the traffic system because there are very few drivers passing by. So you may do potentially, you may drive as, as, as you like, but the impact will be insignificant. By this I want to say that we have always to, to, to keep in mind the factor of complexity and how, we, and how we act when we encounter aspects of complexity in our life. Of course, um, artificial intelligence can increase interconnection, constraints, and change through the constraints the way that we optimize our utility function, if I may use this technical terminology. But this interconnection if one has the sufficient level of vigilance and creativity, gives us opportunities 
to have a more significant impact on the system of the networked, the interconnected individuals in which we participate. So we, everything is a matter of methodology and teleology. Humanity can make a step towards further development or further underdevelopment. This is always a matter of choice and a matter of responsibility. And in this case, I would like to highlight the anthropological research uh, that has been conducted by one of my philosophical mentors, uh, Professor Giuliano Di Bernardo, uh, who uh, was for almost 40 years Professor of Philosophy of Science and Logic at the University of Trento in Italy, and a very senior international Freemason. Um, and uh, I have the honor and the pleasure to be connected with him, uh, not only through the relationship of scholarly mentorship, mentorship, but also in several other aspects and ways. Um, and um, he has written a very, a very um, thorough and uh, synoptic uh, book, The Future of Homo Sapiens, and another one, the, the Epistemological Foundation of Sociology. And we have cooperated on these projects um, and indeed, everything is a matter of intentionality, creativity, and clear setting of goals, clear setting of existential goals. Unfortunately, today, a huge part of humanity, even among the ruling elites has underestimated or ignored the significance of the concept of strategy. Strategy in the deep philosophical and social scientific sense, namely setting clear goals, clear existential goals, and pursuing them in a rational way, in a logically consistent way. And at this point, I would like to highlight a remark made by former U.S. National Security Advisor and International Relations Professor Zbigniew Brzezinski. In the late 1990s, he had wisely warned the ruling United States elites that there is a tendency to put everything on automatic pilot and lose the ability of steersman, steersmanship. So steering with a strategic vision is something rare, and the repetition of the term strategy should not be confused with the actual state of affairs. So every, each and every one of us needs to reconsider one's existential strategy, contemplate on this, and make a clear decision, and then pursue it in a consistent way. Yes, I, I like that. That is, you know, we have we have to keep our hands on the philosophical wheel, so to speak. And I, I like how you mentioned the the driving, and you know how how the implications of driving on a busy roadway that that can be true in a variety of matters, and. Um, 
there there are some matters which seem at least in this modern day to require more wisdom and keen insight uh, in other words a sharp eye that looks beneath the surface and i find that artificial intelligence and to some extent even these self-driving vehicles which are promised and other artificial intelligence may be one of these uh matters that require wisdom something that brings me to sort of the next question which is is artificial intelligence truly artificial or is it possibly something else artificial intelligence is an attempt to approach problem solving and decision making in terms of a mechanical methodology. This is a very fascinating question and I would like to address it very responsibly. Uh, the quintessence, the quintessence of artificial intelligence is the algorithmization of cognitive processes and of decision-making processes. Namely, it, artificial intelligence is an attempt to imitate the operation of the human brain through what we call neural networks modeling the human brain and transforming this model into an electronic system based on what we call neural networks and the purpose is the algorithmization of cognitive processes yet we know in mathematics this has been mathematically proved by a great Austrian mathematician and logician, Kurt Gödel, that total mechanical rigor is mathematically impossible. Uh, can, do, can you give me two, three minutes to, to elaborate on this? Yes, of course. Please do. Okay, so um, let me see how to, to, to handle it very briefly. Um, in the 1930s, uh, the great Austrian mathematician and logician Kurt Gödel undertook to evaluate the logical rigor of formalism. What is formalism? Formalism, in a very sketchy way, is the attempt to transform the entire field of knowledge into a sequence of formulas, or in other words, to algorithmize the entire realm of cognitive processes. Broadly speaking, Gödel considered the statement of the following type consider a statement called P, which is equal to the following, quote-unquote, this statement is false, close the quote, which leads to the following complicated situation. If the statement P equal, if the statement P which equals this statement is false is true, then it is false, but the sentence asserts that it is false. And if it is indeed false, then it must be true, and so on. The earliest study of problems pertaining to self-reference in logic is due to the, 17th, to, is due to the 7th century before common era Greek philosopher and logician Epimenides, who formulated the classical liar paradox. I invite our 
listeners to Google liar paradox. So Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which was proved in the 1930s, shows that such complicated situations can occur in any theory that is consistent and comprehensive enough to, com to contain elementary arithmetic, therefore in the entire uh, field of positive science, as the latter has been encoded by Peano's axioms of, for natural numbers. Consequently, logic is necessary and capable of organizing every mathematical and generally scientific theory, but logic is not sufficient to completely organize itself. According to Gödel, human consciousness in general and thought processes in particular are not merely algorithmic. Gödel established the following argument mathematically. Either the human mind even within the realm of pure mathematics, infinitely surpasses any finite machine, namely any algorithmic process, or else there exist absolutely undecidable arithmetic propositions. To cut the long story short, artificial intelligence is very useful, but it can never defeat human intelligence unless the human being decides intentionally to ontologically degrade its own self. As long as humans are consciously and intentionally creative human beings, they will always be a step ahead of artificial intelligence and they will be the masters of artificial intelligence rather than the slaves of artificial intelligence. However, unfortunately, those human beings which will lapse into lower ontological grades, into lower levels of intentionality, will, of course, be enslaved both to, to artificial intelligence and to the human beings and to those human beings who will be the devious masters and managers of artificial intelligence. But artificial intelligence on its own, by itself, does not have the intrinsic capacity to defeat human intelligence. I love it. It is very, very much uh, something I, I believe that algorithms, unfortunately, are flawed in, in the way that they make assumptions. And I'm always reminded, you know, not to make assumptions because you never know exactly the approximation of the circumstance. And much like people say, don't judge a book by its cover. An algorithm is designed to do exactly that. Very, very good answer, Nicholas. Uh, and I, I really like how you touched base on, unless the human, uh, I, I may mix the words here or mince the words, not correct, but something along the lines, unless humans damage themselves um, through their thinking, right. that self-harm. And it, it very important because it reminds me that, you know, basically sort of to guard, you know, our, our humanity, to guard our light, so to speak. And uh, it, so it makes perfect sense to me, um, which, which sort of brings me to the next question. And that is so, sort of Promethean in nature, which is, you know, Prometheus, of course, the light bringer, which brings a gift to humanity. And this, this brings me to uh, another arena, which is education. And many have complained that the more modern scholastic arena is governed by many devices where students are allowed to have, you know, cell phones, iPads, laptops, etc. in the classroom. And my question is, is it better to kind of that biblical verse, is it better to give a man a fish or to teach him to fish? And do you believe that these modern devices are 
somewhat of a hindrance in 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 the scholarly setting unfortunately even though all these modern devices can be extremely helpful and they have intrinsic value they have been used in a rather problematic way because we have never to confuse the instrument with the user of the instrument and of course we have never to subordinate the user of the instrument with to the instrument by this i want to say the following all these modern devices are blessings that human intelligence has offered to humanity. But, unfortunately, due to power games and a marketing-oriented civilization, classical education, as for instance, has been highlighted by the British classical scholar, educationalist, and academic administrator, Sir Richard Livingstone, whose books I would like to strongly recommend. Contemporary education exhibits several weaknesses because instead of molding, deeply and systematically thinking and creative individuals, it tends to create mechanically programmed basic employees. So we have to readdress, revisit the fundamentals of classical education. That's why one of my uh, best uh, scholars on this subject is uh, Sir Richard Livingstone, who was an Oxford professor and administrator. And um, uh, I believe that uh, we need uh, to highlight uh, the importance of education as creativity and thinking. We have to rediscover the importance of rigorous systematic thinking, both as a manifestation of the most important ontological characteristic of the human being and also thinking as pleasure. Mm -hmm. thinking, thinking can be addressed and should be addressed in, in three complementary ways. Thinking as the most important ontological characteristic of the human being, thinking as a source of creativity and thinking as a source of pleasure. We have never to lose sight of the hedonistic aspect of thinking because unfortunately today we have a great problem also in the field of aesthetic values and in the way that we conceive pleasure. I believe that we have also to revisit and reconsider our aesthetics and our approach to pleasure. I like that. That That is a very good answer. And it reminds me of, at least historically, how important education has been. And even going back to ancient Greece, how those who were quote unquote plebeians or known as plebeian, like the children were expected to enter the workforce at a young age and become 
again, like very robotic employees, as you mentioned. And that sort of brings me to the next question, which is a modern theory that very much, as you know, uh, in a matrix theory scenario, that there are human beings who are created by their world, which obviously goes much against the philosophy that man creates his world along with free will. Man has been given or endowed with reason, discrimination, observation, perception, and the power of using and directing his powers inherent in the thought process. But there is a modern theory that there are, for lack of better word, non playing characters in this matrix theory plebeians if you will or like you said robotic uh employees in your opinion is this reality are we seeing in modern times something akin to a non-playing character i believe that these theories are the result of deep confusion confusion characterizing those who have formulated them and also an attempt to confuse those who will unfortunately consume such arguments. Mm. I believe that we have to study human ontology in a very systematic and realistic way. That's why I highlighted the book also, The Future of Homo Sapiens by Giuliano Di Bernardo, and, the, and also the importance of classical education. I, regarding a rather uh, misleading use of the term matrix, I would like to say that in the history of the philosophy of science, in what we call epistemology, which is one of the branches, one of the major branches of philosophy. One of the major problems, as well as in ontology, is the relationship, which I referred to it earlier, the relationship between the reality of consciousness and the reality of the world. Those who give priority to the reality of the world are called philosophical realists and those who give priority to the reality of consciousness are known as idealists in the history of philosophy. However, we know today that neither of these two schools of ontology can stand as a general theory of reality because Today, we know very well that reality consists of both the reality of the world and the reality of consciousness. Therefore, if one isolates only one of these two aspects and speaks only about a call about reality as a cold real realm of necessities, or, on the other hand, reality as a projection of consciousness and therefore as a pure matrix, both of these two approaches are misguided and misleading. That's why you have very wisely raised the issue of proper, systematic, and rigorous education. There is a deep need, in my humble opinion, to revisit all these issues with scholarly and epistemological sensitivity with a keen consciousness and methodically 
because these issues are very deep issues, but unfortunately they are also offered for <clears throat> commercialization, for psychological operations, for selling commercial but deeply misguided and misguiding books. We have to work with epistemological sensitivity and responsibility and to, it, to, to take things in a rigorous way and start from the basics built in deductively upwards. And again, I would like to, to stress for our audience that today, both in philosophy and science, we are aware of the dynamic interplay between the reality of consciousness and the reality of the world. None of these two dimensions of reality or none of these two variables of reality is the entire reality in itself. There is a structural continuity between the world and consciousness. It's not just consciousness, it's not just world. There is a structural continuity between these two aspects and constituent components of what we call reality. Therefore, we have constrained freedom. Yes. Neither only, neither only constraints, nor only freedom. I like that. Constrained freedom. Isn't that the truth? And um, I, I know you're a very busy man. We've gone a little bit over. I hate to constrain the freedom of asking you more questions. You've answered a bunch of pressing, difficult questions with grace and responsibility, Nicholas. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you so very much for sharing your thoughts. Where can listeners get more of your work, your thoughts, and follow, follow what you do? Um, unfortunately, having been overwhelmed with my research work and the project that I handle, I have not yet organized a personal website. I will have it under construction. So please, please give me some time to share it with our audience through you after a few months when my book will also be ready. Absolutely. And I will share um, some of your other books in the show notes and the links. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Have a blessed day and appreciate your time. Thank you very much. I'm grateful to you for our friendship and communication. Thank you. What a bright guy. It's always a blessing to talk to Nicholas Laos. He has a variety of books, which are shockers. They're deep. Although he has a tremendous amount of literary works, let me go into just a few. The Metaphysics of World Order, Methexiology, the Carological Kabbalah, the Modern and Perfecting Rite of Symbolic Masonry, Foundations of Colonial Diplomacy, The Meaning of Being Illuminati, and the list goes on and on. Now, most of those books are hard to get a hold of. If you can get a hold of any of them, I highly recommend purchasing them, as I do whenever they become available, because his books are gems. He is a mastermind in many ways, and of course, a supreme grandmaster as well. And his books are much like the conversations I have with him. I will read one of his books, and then I will reread it and pick up a bunch of stuff I didn't catch the first time. The same is true of my conversations with Nicholas Laos. I appreciate his friendship, his work, and... Uh, I know it's not the usual as far as the podcast usually goes, but hey, we need to kind of branch out and, you know, ask big questions to different folks and get different answers to really add to the tapestry of what's really going on in our current world. And I hope you've enjoyed this. Until next time, keep your eyes to the skies, feet on the ground, but don't forget to take a look around. Esoteric Research Organization. 
Hero paranormal always setting up the pace, man. Crop circle tipping, Illuminati still tripping. Making those ears perk up, gonna make, make you, you question, question your earth. earth. You better. Mystery bloodlines and secret society Creepy shit, shit to say is come sit beside me <laughs> Yeah, go see all that So what's with all this spy drone Acting like UFOs <laughs> So we put in space wolf Tiptoe through the dark Third eye blinding Tune in and blast off, blast off Blast off, baby Blast off